Shalom, 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 Shabbat shalom. Yes, greetings once again. Salam tat ena yist aling. Ene wendem yad. And we're going to move forward with the 19th uh, orit nebab, min bab, which is called uh, teruma. Teruma. And so we've touched on some of the key um, some of the key words, namely the name of this particular Torah portion. That's very fundamental to deal with the name, as well as the opening um, scriptural parasha or the portion. And we know that it commences. Let's line this up for you as best as possible. This is so we can see both Bamarinya and Inglesinya, the Amharic and the English in one view right here. Now, the Amharic is the Metz of Caduce, is from His Majesty's Bible. And we've also touched on the materials and some of the significance, some of the significance of the materials as well as the colors. The materials as well as the colors. And we touched on the gold, the work, being the Melakot or divinity, mm. and the the deity, the divinity and the deity in its manifestation, in the manifestation, the gold is symbolic of the manifestation. In other words, that divine. In other words, we're speaking about the divine bling, or the divine bling bling. Now, I think we were able to um, let's get that. Uh, Get those um, particular, particular. Um, here we go, right here. Now we're dealing with the tabernacle, and these are some of the relative um, images of the tabernacle. So here's a. Let's call this. This is this is one particular picture that we've we've used previously, and let's see if we can blow it up. To see it more full, full screen right here. So we have the tabernacle in the wilderness. This is the vision. This is the vision of the Dinquan, of the Debta, of the tabernacle, the Mishkan. Now the word Mishkan too, which is the technical word for 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 the tabernacle in the Hebrew, is a particular word, and there's a particular what we call the the backstory or the ancient narrative the ancient narrative and the ancient most um documentation of the narrative is in the is in the Egyptian but the code to understanding the ancient Egyptian even the um Medu Netter or the Medu Inter uh hieroglyphic writing is the Ethiopic the Ethiopic or the good is the good is code and one of the code scriptures is the Ethiopic Enoch as well, but continue with the divine bling bling, which is one of the first elements that is actually. Let's close this up right here. One of the first elements that's that's mentioned that's mentioned in the outline of the Mishkan is the Ark of the Covenant. So let's get a more fuller, a more fuller demonstration example of the Ark of the Covenant which is which is a gold overlaid over the Gerar or a special type of um wood what's known as the acacia the acacia wood. So we have the acacia wood here. And this is okay, this is the Ark right there or the Tabot. This is one artist rendition of the Tabo. We've seen many different interesting renditions. If you look at the way the poles are placed and some of the other um, arc or Tabo renditions, the, the poles are placed um, along the other sides, not that particular side. Now, the cherubim too, this is based on the European, um, European concepts or, or latter Let's call it latter day or Gentile goy concepts. So there's some there's some correct features that are outlined there, but there's also some incorrect 
um, proportions, features, as well as the, the kerub or the kepra, basically the kepra, the cherubim or the kepra. But we'll get into some of the details of that as we proceed. Now here you you see an Egyptian artistic rendition of of the Ark of the Covenant based on the Egyptian ancient Egyptian ideas. Now in ancient Egypt the, the Ark is called the Dept the Dept or the Tept the Tept and linguistically this is related. Let's bring up the article or tracing the hand of Moses in Genesis, which we showed in the in the first in the first part. And now we have this right here. This, we have the there it goes right there. The D the D B the D B T the depth right here, the depth or the tept. So this is the hand. It's a hand, the calf of a leg, and some say a loaf of bread or a side loaf of bread. This sort of, sort of a, a half circle symbol. And then what we have right here is what they call the determiner. The determiner. And the determiner would be to determine what kind of like noun it is, you know, is it an abstract, is it a subject, uh, you know, the person, place, or thing, what kind of a person, place, or thing, and this definitely describes it as a, a thing, that particular representation there as a thing. Now, that is interesting because in the Ethiopic, the word for, the word for Ark, or the Ark of the Covenant, is known as the Tabot. And let's see if we can bring up that picture of the Ark, um, the Ark of the Covenant in His Imperial Majesty's time. And if you look at this particular, it's overlaid or it's, it's covered with the purple, with the, there's a covering. You know, in some of these pictures, you see where, the, where they have the Levites carry the Ark of the Covenant. Out and here's some some additional Ark of the Covenant um, visuals, some additional visuals right here of the Ark of the Covenant. This the the, the Kepra are a little more accurate here, although we think that the the carrying staffs or staves would have been on the other side, as 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 is pictured in actual some actual arc. So we said this is the artistic rendition right here. But um those particular details we will touch on as we go forward, as we actually let the scriptures, you know, um not um have some people say uh um you know um about the word and man. What was that that way that the elder used to say about the word? Something about the word and the man, like a uh, man defining the word, or the word defining man. I, 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 when I remember it, I'll I'll share that portion. That was just a little flashback right there. But now the Kepler right here, or the Cherub right here, are a little more accurate scripturally and historically. When we put it, not in a Western Gentile miss miss um misunderstanding uh, or, or misinterpretation from a Gentile Western or white perspective, but when we put it in its true ancient e e Egyptian as well as its African and Ethiopian um, context, we see that there are different, you know, there are different um, artists who some of them reading the Bible, some of them following what other artists have, have done. So if you look even on the Internet for, like, um, Ark pictures, Ark of the Covenant pictures, you're going to see a lot of different concepts and a lot of different conceptions. Some of them may have correct features here or there, but really it's the word, you know, it's, 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 it's the word um, that gives us the true... Um, the true context. Here's the Ethiopian priest carrying an ark right here, carrying an ark, which is very interesting because that's about the size, roughly the size 
of the Ark of the Covenant. Um, in this particular picture for Ethiopian priests carrying the Ark, then we have this particular Ark right here as well. So we're going to look at some of these various Ark pictures. As you can see this, and you can see how the the Kephrai or the Kephra or the Cherub, some say Cherub, but really Kepru, the Kepru are right here as well. You understand? And um, so the scriptures actually lays out how they are supposed to look, but there's, there's various, like this, this is another couple of examples of, of, of what's wrong with some of the arcs people have um, made themselves believe is the ark. They, if you look at this particular ark, although the poles might have been on that particular side, but when they imagine the Kepra, because they're not referring to the true context, which is which is an Afro-Shemitic sense. In other words, it's, it's, it's African, it's Shemitic. Yes, Africans are Shemites. They are Afro-Shemites. These are things that from a Western Gentile misunderstanding or, or misconception are not, um, are not well understood, are not well understood and are misunderstood understood. Okay, this is interesting here. Here's a stargate. You can see a stargate now. I could say how did this get in there, but I wanted you to just to check that out for a moment. So there's a there's a stargate right there. What does the stargate have to do with the ark? A lot, but we'll deal with that as we go forward. So let's go forward and see if we find this picture of, of his majesty in the Ark of the Covenant. Um I have to look at another folder, but the point being that the Egyptian um, determiner, the determiner which is used for the for the Ark of the Covenant in in the Egyptian hieroglyphs, actually matches what we see pictured in this I think 1950s photo, roughly of His Majesty in Ethiopia at a at a um, ceremony in Aksum, in the holy city of Aksum, the Ark of the Covenant was brought out in um, public in the one of the rear, but during the time of His Majesty, the Ark was brought brought forward as in the time of um, His Majesty Emperor uh, Menelik II, or Dagmawi Menelik, the Ark was also brought forward in in procession. The thing is, like I mentioned before, is that when the ark is brought forward, it's always covered by a particular type of cloth. Now, we also know that because of the scriptures. The scriptures tells us that there's a particular ordinance, you know, a particular ordinance. It's a particular way to get good results. And unfortunately, what we see in a lot of the um, Gentile Western conceptions um we get to see another another perspective which is we get to find out by study is not true now some speculate that the ark actually was a throne and this is also kind of interesting right here that the ark actually represented um a a throne for for divinity let's close up some of these other pictures so you get to see this that one this is interesting in the Kepra, the, the design of the Kepra. We'll return to that one right there. As you know, here is um, an Ethiopian priest carrying for, forth um, a symbolic ark right there. And here's a speculation from one scholar, researcher. Forgive us, we don't remember his name right now, but this information is out there. You can look it up on the Internet. We're speaking of an Egyptian ark or the the Dept and or the Tept. Now from the ancient Egyptian hieroglyphs we have two different words which refer to the ark. We have the Dept or the Deptera, the root of the Depter, the Deptera or the Dept of Re of Ra, which is a tabernacle, a Mishkan, um, to say like the the, the tabernacle of Oh, in the wilderness, the tabernacle of Moses. Then we have the next word that comes from this same hieroglyph and bring up that hieroglyph again. This is from the page uh, 
tracing, tracing the hand of Moses in Genesis, where you see the the hand, the the leg or the calf of the leg, which is called bati, and that's where the B come from, the hand. Some say from the yad or the id in the Hebrew, which is ij in the Amharic, the id, the hand, extended open, you could say hand, the calf of the leg, and a loaf of bread. And then we have that determiner, that particular determiner right there. So as we said, others speculate that the ark can be a symbolic a symbolic um, throne. And there was one particular video that we seen, I think it was the truth teller or the truth seer who speculated on throwing the diamonds up, you know, that, that thing that a lot of folks speculate with the Illuminati, you know, um, the diamond or the rock. And th some say that this is really sp speaks of the divine or the misuse or the satanic application of this divine triangle sign or trinity sign. But actually where it really comes from, originates from, is from the holy place. And in this particular conception of the ark, we get to see um, that particular um, triangle or what some will call the Illuminati Jay-Z sign, you know, and he tries to be like Jehovah, Jehovah, you, you get it, you know what I mean? But um, there's a very important backstory to all of that, which some of these so-called Illuminati agents and, and assets might be using consciously or unconsciously. Most likely, a lot of this is being done unconsciously because the real background to much of what we see symbolically being done is in the very um, infancy of humanity. In other words, these shapes, these types, these symbols... Um, even the Mishkan, speaking of the tabernacle, the tabernacle is like the birthing, is the birthing chamber. And remember, the Lord says, I've called my son, my son out of Egypt. So the tabernacle also, in a sense, would represent, would represent the birthing abode because Israel was a child then. Israel was a son or the young solar God. But we go a little bit ahead of um, perhaps the majority of the students, if not ourselves, getting to that particular point. But Gerald Macy in his uh, first um, volume, A Book of the Beginning, did touch on that um, significance, the significance of the Mishkan, which is more of an advanced level of study. But what we're trying to do right here is give a basic, some basic um some basic reference points here. Here's, here's the picture that we, we spoke about a little bit earlier concerning, concerning the ark right here that's been somewhat falsified purposely or, or by accident, just by ignorance. Here it's supposed to show um, the Levites carrying the ark of the covenant, carrying it without any covering on it, you know? Um, what is interesting is that this is a possible, you know, the, the way the Kepra are portrayed right here, or the cherubim. Because remember, the cherubim were known in ancient Egypt as the, as the, the Kepra, the Kepra, like as in Capricorn, or the Kepra, which, which guarded the holy place. You also see that in the winged images, the particular winged Egyptian images, which is very particular to Egypt. So the concept for the cherubim, when we read later on in this particular uh, Teruma portion of the, of the cherubim, the original idea of the mosaic idea came out of Egypt because that was, that was his schooling. That was where he was educated in the wisdom of the Egypts. So most likely when we conceive of the, the Kepra or the cherubim, we must look first of all linguistically to link cherub, the cherub with the Egyptian Kepra, Kepra, cherub. You know, once we can make that connection, that bridge, 
then a lot of this matter will become very much more more clear. Now, here's one other example of a symbolic tabot or tebet or tabernacle. Here we see um, Amon Re in his boat, in his square, in his tabernacle. So we see the, the boat idea of ark being symbolized here, right? Then we also see the square, you know, the square tabernacle or the ark in the latter sense of the portable ark. So it's very interesting when we, you know, look at Noah's Ark, we look at the Ark that baby Moses was put in, then we look at the fact that Joseph said, carry my bones out, Jacob got embalmed like an Egyptian pharaoh, you know, he was embalmed, obviously had a very big um, 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 ceremonial uh, funeral or, or of the mysteries, you read about that right there in the Bible, and they link that funeral for Jacob, who is the one known as Israel, the, the Canaanites and those who witness it connected with Abel, Abel. Now, when you look at Abel and the original black, perfect black, Lord of the perfect black, or Saul or Osiris, and the ideas of these arcs, the arcs mean a chest, a coffin, it becomes, after a while, a very um, simple picture to really make and paint and link the two together. But what has happened is that ancient Egypt has been so misinterpreted and a lot of the matter been demonized, partly because of ignorance and partly because of racism. So when folks today think that, well, your biblical concepts are so heavily related to Egypt where they so-called worshipped um you know, the ancestors and the gods, and then you get to find out that, well, the, the Hebrews, their judges were Elohim. They were gods, and the ancestral worship, worship, one can look at the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's not speaking of anybody else's ancestors, but it's mainly speaking of the ancestors of of the Israelites or our ancestors. So there's, a, and, and that God is the God of our ancestors, in other words, that's that's the key and the overriding point in that same period. But then Acts of the Apostles, chapter 7, verse 22, clarifies it for those who are willing. But many so-called nominal Christians are still willing to be ignorant. It says that Moses was learned in all the wisdom of the Egyptians, or really of the Egypts, upper and lower Egypt, and was mighty in word and deed. And that's why he was chosen to be the one who he was to deliver his people because he was, he was learned in that which was necessary to get them out of the situation. So those who don't want to really look at the fullness of this picture and explore the fact that the Israelites were in Egypt for 400 years, that means they must have known Egyptians. It's not like Charleston Heston and all that whitewash garbage that you have been probably, you know, polluted with through the media. But um, the image that we was looking for while we was just, just reasoning about some of these basic matters and showing you some of the, you know, some of the um, relative images and pictures has eluded us for a moment. But just keep that um, hieroglyphic in mind. Mm. And we'll return to that. There's a terminal right there. Just in, in the visual, in the visual image of it, it reminded me of what we saw in the picture of His Majesty with the Ark of the Covenant, the black and white picture. No doubt, you probably have seen it or can see it in one of the one of the previous videos that we have done on the Ark of the Covenant um, in the time of His Imperial Majesty Haile Selassie I. Now, as we continue with this, let's continue. Let's once again go over um, these elements here. The elements of the gold. The gold is the deity, the deity in manifestation, the divine glory. Um, now, the principles from ancient Egypt 
are still manifest in the Bible. The big difference really is what you're seeing here of Amon Re in his um in his symbolic ark on his symbolic boat. So in his ark within his ark. So ark within the ark. Um the difference keyly is that the understanding of the abstract based on the ancient Hebraic and based on the the school of thought, the Mosaic school of thought, was particularly, in other words, they had grown from the kindergarten phase of the spirituality where they had to use natural, you know, like images to portray it, and it became more abstract. Yet the basic concepts, the basic concepts of even the Ark comes out of Egypt that cannot be denied. But instead of having... Um, animal images like the golden calf incident when the Israelites um, ask Aaron, whose name actually means Ark, which is also very significant that the name Aaron, Aaron actually means Ark. And just to document that for you, let's bring up tracing the hand of Moses in Genesis and scroll up here. And you can see that the Akkadian or the Canaanite word for ark used is Aaron. Aaron means a coffin, a coffin like a sarcophagus in a sense or some sort of other symbolic chest. And it's used in Genesis chapter 50, verse 26. And if I'm correct, that is the funeral. That is during the time of the funeral for the... Israelite patriarch, the funeral, the, bur the burial of Yaakov, the burial of um, Jacob. And in verse 26, which is the last verse in chapter 50, last verse in Genesis, it says, so Yosef, Joseph, uh, he did, he died, excuse me, Joseph died now, being an 110 years old. So he was 110 or Eleven zero, hundred and ten years old, and they embalmed him in the Egyptian way of embalming, as you've seen in so many of these these um, discovery kind of videos about uh, e Egyptology. And he put, and he was put in a coffin, and then he was put in a what coffin in Egypt? Now the word coffin that you find in your Bible in the Hebrew, it uses the word Aaron, the very same word that would be used of the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark of the Covenant. Remember the key thing about the king who rose up was that he did not know Joseph. In other words, he was not of the religion of Joseph or he was not of the the God, we can say. He was not of the God of Joseph. So Joseph represents a progression of um we can say religious religious ideas and 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 religious um theology in ancient Egypt. And the king who arose was going back to a more primitive a more primitive state or a more um some would say it was pure in the past, but um Think about it. Think about what you've learned in your own lives as you've grown up, if you've grown up. Now, if you haven't grown up, then no doubt you haven't learned very much. But if you have grown up, you recognize that there is progress in moving forward, but some move backwards. So the king who rose up was retrograding religiously. He was going back to a more primitive or a more backward form of the religion. So as Joseph... And, and the Israelite Tish faith or the Mosaic faith is bringing in the, for lack of a better word, the true deity, which to those who are worshiping the false deity, it seemed to be a new deity. So he was bringing a new, a new God. Who is this Jehovah? Who is this Jah? He was bringing in Jah Adonai. He was bringing in Adoni, who was the original, the old God or the true Amen now was being revealed. He was the true illuminator, the illuminator. In other words, it was, this was an illumination. 
But others thought that they were under the, the true light. They were under the bad luck, and thus the plagues in ancient Egypt was the bad luks, the ba'id luks. It was the strange light because the old gods that they were worshiping were actually the demon gods or the fallen angels gods. So it's, there's, a, there's, there's more of a backstory to this, but not to... Um, dwell on that too much right now, but I think it's just significant. Just make a note of this right here in Genesis 50 and 26, that Joseph was put where? He was put in an Aaron. What's the word Aaron mean? He was put in an ark. And what did he strictly um, command his, his, his brothers and his descendants to do? That he knew that Jah would visit, that the true God would visit the Passover sign really the cross over sign. We're going to touch on that hopefully in another in another series of vids, how we say Passover, Pesach, Fasica, but really in studying the etymology of it, it's not so much the Passover, it's actually the cross over or the God of the Hebrews, the Ibre, the crossing over sign. Not just the passing over sign, but actually the crossing over sign and we'll get into a little bit more of um you know we'll document that a little bit more as as we go through so joseph told his descendants that's why that verse is it seems just a, a verse and people make a religiously you know they're saying joseph said my bones take my bones out of why was that word so important how did he know that god would would visit you understand, would visit in a prescribed time, in a prescribed season, because he knew God's clockwork. He understood this clear that, that Joseph would have been called a, an astrologer. You might have even called him an occultist, uh, you know, or a sorcerer, based on what he knew, where he was focused, compared to and vis-a-vis -vis where um, the sheeple or his people who are living like sheeple were focused. Now, this is another picture that we wanted to, to bring forward to show you concerning this portion right here. And this picture, if you think, is a beautiful picture, especially the colors, because it basically descriptively describes um, the different offerings that are mentioned. These are the four coverings of the tabernacle, the four coverings of the tabernacle. And um, there's badger's skin, which is the outward, the outward appearance. There's the ram skin, which is dyed red, um, dyed red, and it represents the substitutionary sacrifice. Then there is the woven, the woven, um, this part right here, the woven, um, um, goat here, you understand? Let's enlarge it a little bit more. I think you'll be able to see the writing, the writing on it right here. So we have the badges, the badger skin, the, the outward appearance is unattractive, right? Isaiah 53, 1 to 2. Remember we saw about the types? When you look at Isaiah, if you go to Isaiah chapter 53, in Isaiah chapter 53, let's let's go there for a moment. Isaiah chapter 53, verses 1 to 2. Let us let us read. It says, "Who hath believed? The who hath amen? Who has exercised true and faithful witness? Amen. Who hath amen our report?" And to whom is the arm of Yahweh revealed? Who is, to whom is the arm? And even that is very significant when we understand and comprehend and interpret properly the verbal hieroglyphic, the arm, the, the amsu cheru, the lifter of the arm. We did another video which spoke about the arm because when it says the arm of the Lord revealed. So we have understood hieroglyphically, who has our main, our report? In other words, who, who has, who has um, the ability to see the, the unknown God? See, in ancient Egypt, our main was known as the unknown God. 
But in in in, in true Christian uh, true Christianity, in 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 our Ethiopic faith, we know that this this Amen is truly Christ. Revelation chapter three verse fourteen. So we have a revelation of Jesus Christos, even in his what pre incarnate before he was born now when we look at the tabernacle the mishkan and look at that word mishkan mishkan in the ancient primitive culture was a birthing abode it was it was a place of giving birth you know and so we have the tabernacle as this type in a sense of kedistin gumarium of the black madonna of our black mother of the black mother of our black Lord and Savior Jesus Christo. So who has who has admitted this as true? And to whom is the arm of Jah revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant, and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him there is no beauty that we should desire him. Now, this is likened to the badger skin or the, or, or the outward, this outward part. But then it has John chapter 1, verses 10 to 14. So when we go to the New Testament now, remember we need to get the New Testament authority to understand properly, understand the types and, and symbols and symbolism. In 10 and uh, in actually chapter 1, verse 10 to 14, John chapter 1, verses 10 to 14, it says, He was in the world, and the world was made by him. The Amen, the true Amen, Christos, Yeshua, was in the world, and the world was made by him. And the world, what? Knew him not. Knew not the Son. See, Joseph. The, the king who rose up did not know Joseph. You, you get to see that in that sense. He did not know Joseph. And 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 the Amen in ancient Egypt is the unknown God or the hidden God. Christ says, I was there with you in the beginning. And I'm sure his disciples were thinking, what do you, in the beginning, we just met you a couple of years ago. You know, he spent three and a half years with them. So, like, in the beginning, the beginning of what? He's speaking about um, Berasit, in Seno Bereshet. In the beginning, in Genesis, in the, in the, uh, uh, what it says, uh, Zatepi, in, or the first time, as they say in ancient Egypt, in the first ages, in, in, in that, before, what is it, the land that was slain, what, before the world, before the world was created. So here we find the two classes. There are two classes. There are the sons, you understand, the children, the sons, to say like the Israelites, God's son, and they are the unbelievers. You understand, those who don't have or don't know the Amen, who was in the world, and the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. So you see, Moses, Moshe did not steal the commandments or any of this, or, or he stole these, like a lot of fake, even the black Egyptologists might think in their ongoing wrestling with white supremacy. When they get to the Ethiopic root, what, one thing you recognize or should recognize is that it wasn't about, oh, the Egyptians had it and the Israelites stole it from them. No, it was about the revelation of God and his son, plain and simple. You know, and that's what the Egyptians knew it at one time, coming from their, their priests, the true priests, coming from Mero, Meroe, coming from Tob and Tobia, the ancient Egyptian and the ancient Ethiopian priesthood. They knew it at one time. They knew it when they received Joseph. But after Joseph passed away, you know, times change, years go by, people start to backslide and they return to their vomit, and they return to their mud, and they return to their filthiness. So there are two classes. There are the children, and then there are the unbelievers. You understand? He came to his own, and his own received him not. His own did not Kabbalah him. His own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the what? The sons of God even to them that believed or amened on his name. 
which were born, not of blood. This is why the Mebba is a bloodless sacrifice. You understand? Not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh. You understand? Nor of the will of the flesh. It wasn't of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. Remember the key part where it says, Belibu, Kamiyamuro, Sohulu, Mebba. You understand? The, the receive the Mebba of all of those who in their heart, you understand, in the innermost of their of their innermost or in their inner sense, you understand, has this rooted in them. They 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 have God or knowledge of God as their gnosis. But this all leads to the incarnation. And in ancient Egypt and in this parsha or portion, we're getting a type by seeing the tabernacle and by studying the tabernacle, studying the materials studying the elements, even when we study the positioning of the tabernacle, we're going to see a type of the cross. We're going to actually see the cross. Even the skull and bones is at the, is at the foot of Christ. Think about it for a moment. Skull and bones, they always show you the bones there like a cross, right? And Christ was crucified where? In the place of the skull. You understand? In the place of the skull. Now, that has a deeper even a psychological application. But first, like Christ said, if you can't understand the natural things, the earthly things, how are you going to understand the heavenly things? So the incarnation, the incarnation of the birth of Christ, we have in verse 14 of John chapter 1, and the Word was made what? Flesh. The Word, something that is not flesh and blood, that is immaterial what became material or took on through condensation flesh or it took on material form it took on what matter it took on a mother in our words a mother a mother and dwelt amongst us because now it was born amongst us and we beheld his what his glory remember gold is that element of the divine manifestation of deity representing the divine glory and we beheld his glory or his his aura and the glory the glory as of the only begotten really the andialage the first you understand the the one and only begotten of the Father, because this is the Son. This is the Bain Ha Elohim, full of grace and full of grace and truth. And furthermore, if you go up two or three verses in verse 17, it says, For the law or Torah was given by Moses. Now, people say, But grace, but grace. If you look at the but right there in, 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 in um, verse 17, it's italicized, which means in the in the Greek, in the Septuagint, that wasn't there. So it would really have read, for Torah, or the law was given, the Orit, by Musa. Grace and truth came by Jesus Christo. See, what they want you to do is say, forget about the Torah. The Torah is Old Testament. That doesn't really mean anything. But then if you do that, you will fall into the unloving arms of Antichrist. And this is what, what's happened to the world today. This is why most of the Christians and most of them don't have any spiritual power against these end-time works and delusions of Antichrist because they have no foundation. They have moved off of the divine square. The tabernacle is a divine square. So here we have the badger skin. Here we have the ram skin dyed red, substitutionary sacrifice. Here we have the woven goat here. You understand? It's cursed. It's a sin offering. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 37. Second Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21. We'll give you a little more background on now why this woven goat here is put over the tabernacle. Why is it put even at this particular position? Then we have, which covers the tabernacle most directly, we have the cherubim embroidered, you understand, the cherubim or the cherubim or the kepra, the kepra were embroidered, Genesis 3, 24, Ezekiel 1 and 13, looking down, they are as of looking down from ceiling, and it was, or the cherubim as looking down from heaven, Cause remember Moses in the mount, Mount Sinai, he got a peak in a sense of that which 
is in the heavens. He got a peek of that which were in the heavens, and he was told to make a tabernacle exactly like what he had seen in the heavens. Now, this is very interesting when we start to now really, you know, do our homework and, and map out, you know, this tabernacle. And when we look at the, the ground plan of the tabernacle, as it's seen from heaven, we're going to see that the, the, the ground plan of a cross. Some even see the temple of man, especially in the temple age of Solomon. You can see that Solomon's temple is much like um, the, the temple from Karnak in ancient Egypt, like the temple of man. But moreover, when you look at the, the pattern, let's, in fact, let's, let's see if we can show this to you right here because it will go a long way in, um, you know, making the point about what we're saying here. Let's close this up right here. Now, you're familiar with that. We touched on that right there. This is basically the three things that I dealt with in this portion right here. Um, we're talking about the Ark of the Covenant right here. Next thing we're going to talk about is the menorah, you understand, or the light. Jah is my light and my salvation, right? And then the bread, you understand, the bread, you know, um, they give us this day our daily bread. So all of these, even though they're material images and they have a material form, they are types. This was like the kindergarten of the Israelites. So this is like the kindergarten lesson right here. And Christ is like, um, we can say, the, the high school and college, more like the college level, you know, college and university. Yovis. But more, I would say, like if Torah would be our kindergarten or, or K through 12, in that sense, then definitely Christ is, is more high school. It's a higher school and a more university level. You always accept Christ said that because of the deficiency of the people, he was only able, you know, there was more he wanted to tell us, but the people of that time were not able to accept those things. And I'm sure that there's a so-called extraterrestrial um, dimension to the more that he wanted to uh, tell us, but not being the people not being able to receive it. Let's see if we can find this um, this uh, the tabernacle picture in here. Here we it's the cross Mishkan. I think we have it right here. Let's bring it up. Um, the cross Mishkan. Uh, where, where did that thing just go? Did I knock it out? Okay, here we go, people. There we go. There we go, right there. Here we go, right there. Okay, you see this? This is the encampment of the Israelites. In other words, the part that we just talked about and just showed, um, the tabernacle, right? This, this is right here. That's right here. This is the lava of water right there. Um... This is the, the the brazen altar for sacrifice. This is the gateway. This is the entrance. This is the courtyard, right, to the tabernacle or the sanctuary, we can say. Here is the gateway. And now here we have the tribes. The first encampment is Isaac, Isaac well, one say Isaac, Char, but Issachar, Issachar, Yehuda, Judah, and Zebulun. And Zebulun, this is the first encampment, right, from the east. So we enter through the east, you see, but the tabernacle itself and this little little dot right here that you might see right here is the Ark of the Covenant. But the but the tabernacle is facing west, is facing the Amenta, is facing west. Now these are the twelve tribes encamped as three tribes on the four sides, but you can clearly see that this is the shape of a cross. You can clearly see the shape of the cross. Now, why is this important? While well, we still have time, let's see if we still have this on our on our on our search right here, um, because as above they say, so below, right? 
as above, so below. If you look at the heavens, right, there's a cross constellation up in the heavens. I like to call it like the Lalaba constellation. And when you look at the Lalaba constellation, it's under, I think, is, is that Perseus? Not Pegasus, but Perseus, so under the horse's hoofs right here. You understand? Under the horse's hoofs right here. And it's a cross constellation. It almost reminds me of Lalabella. You understand? The rock hewn sanctuary. Remember what Christ said? If we cannot comprehend these earthly things, you know, then how should we be able to comprehend, you know, these uh, heavenly, heavenly signs? You know, so he said they, he had more things to tell us. You see, more things to tell us. So when we look at the sanctuary on earth and we look at badger skins and ram skin that was dyed red and, 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 the, and the woven goats here and, and the cherubim design, you understand, the cherubim em, embroidery, you know, what does these things mean? What's the, 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 the significance of the gold? What's the significance of the silver? As we've touched on um, already, and we'll go over this one more time here, this portion outlines the general authority for the types of Exodus. The general authority for the types of Exodus is found here. And the typical meanings of the materials and the colors of the tabernacle are as follows. The gold is the melakot, or the deity in manifestation, not just the deity, but the deity in manifestation, being manifested, in other words. The silver is redemption. The brass is a symbol of judgment, as in the brazen altar, and as in the serpent of brass that was lifted up in the wilderness, which even Christ himself said, as Moses raised up the serpent in the wilderness, so, much the son, so must the Son of Man be lifted up as well. Now, of course, there's a deeper significance, but if we cannot understand these, these earthly and these, and these primitive um, mythological signs, you know, the, how ancient man and the people of Christ's time and the people of Moses' time understood these symbols, then how can we really understand these higher things? You understand these higher things speaking about the heavens. So we have the, the crux, the crux right here, the heavenly crux, and then we have the earthly crux. So this helps us get to the, the very crux or the cross of, of, of the matter, or the crux of the matter, the cross of the matter. So the crucifixion sign or the sign of Christ being crucified must have a deeper heavenly significance. Lalabella being a rock-hewn church also pointing to heavenly points and heavenly and and heavenly um signs is also very significant especially when they line up now the blue the blue is heavenly in nature or origin speaking of heavenly things later we'll find that the blue as in the blue and white is is, is symbolic of um of of the priesthood as well as the, the, the medical physician aspects, the color blue. So the blue and the white, we can look at this as law and order, and order also covering hygienic order, hygienic purity. When we hear about this is clean and this is unclean, it's speaking about ritual but hygienic purity. You understand? Because God's people must be healthy and therefore must also be clean. In, in spirit and in truth. Purple is a symbol of royalty. Purple is a symbol of royalty. You know, purple, we have purple in, in Revelation dealing with the woman who's riding on the beast. So that means that this, this woman riding on the beast has a claim, which obviously is a false claim, to royalty. Then we have scarlet or red. We have the color red, the lady in red. The lady in red, so-called, is, is, in other words, a lady of sacrifice. There's some sort of a sacrifice because red is symbolic or scarlet is the symbolic color for sacrifice. So as we begin to decipher these particular elements 
of the tabernacle. And let's get a a closer a closer um shot of his majesty, Kadamawi Hala Selassie, also coming out of a, an Ethiopian tabernacle. You understand? An Ethiopian tabernacle right here, which is a very interesting um picture. Um and it has also more significance, but the key of the significance is right here. So God Jah instructs Moses to tell all the Israelites whose hearts so moved them, whose hearts were so agreeable, not disagreeable, you understand, but whose hearts were so agreeable to do what? Whose hearts were so agreeable and whose hearts so moved them to bring gifts, to bring gifts of gold, silver, copper, colored yarn, fine linen, goat's hair, canned ram skins, acacia wood, oil, spices, lapis lazuli, or lazuli, lapis lazuli, and other fine stones for what purpose? To make a sanctuary, to make a mechdes, to make a holy place, the tabernacle or the mishkan the Mishkan and its furnishings, so that God, Ha Elohim, the true God, could dwell among them. Exodus chapter 25, verses 1 to 8. So Ha Elohim instructs them to make the first thing, to, to make the Ark of the Covenant of a particular kind of wood, acacia in the English, or garar, inchet, Acacia wood overlaid with gold in which to deposit, in which to place in it the tablets, the silat, the tones, tablets setting forth God's pure law or God's pure will or what we know as God's commandment, often called the Ten Commandments. Exodus chapter 25, verses 10 to 16. Ha Elohim told them to make two kiru, keru, cherub, cherubim of gold to place on the ark's cover or the mercy seat. And this is what we um, have been discussing a little bit already, showing you some of the artists, the various, um, you know, artist um, conceptions as we have here and elsewhere of what the ark of the covenant um might have might have um might have looked like and um let's just bring this up again uh right here here's a, just to remind you right here here's some of the um this is a Ethiopian carrying the ark or carrying an ark because each Ethiopian um Beta Christian Orthodox True Faith Beta Christian has an Ark of the Covenant, or at least symbolic, sim, symbolically has an Ark of the Covenant um, inside. And Ethiopia has also made the positive claim that has not been debunked, just has been disbelieved, that Ethiopia possesses the true Solomonic Ark of the Covenant. So God told them to make two cherubim of gold to place on the Ark's cover, or what is known as this place right up here, what is known as the mercy seat, this area right here, what is known as the mercy seat. Exodus chapter 25, verses 17 to verse 21. Ha Elohim Baruchu, blessed be he, promised to impart commandments to Moses from between the two cherubim above the cover of the ark. Now this is interesting when we think about this and some of the sci fi and the sci reality um of today. Exodus twenty five twenty two that the Almighty said that he would communicate, right, with Musa between the what? Between the Kiru, 
between the cherubim on top of on top of the mercy seat. So that means roughly in this space right here. You understand? Taking this as as one particular um symbolic uh symbolic um arc of the covenant. Let's see if we um this one is probably even more symbolically um um relevant right here. Let's move this up here and take this take this one right down here so you can see this. So we'll be in this space right here, in this Trinity space right here, between the cherubim on top on top of the mercy seat. So the Almighty would communicate, would speak to Moses in this particular space right there. Interesting. Ha Elohim instruct them to make a table, to make now a table of acacia wood, to make a table of acacia wood. So the same kind of wood, you understand, this, this very same kind of wood is also to be used to make a table. Let's see if we can, and this is the part that we're about to touch on right here, speaking of the show, the shoe the table of shoe bread, as you can see before you, which is a pretty accurate, you know, symbolically speaking, rendition. So Ha Elohim instructed them to make a table of acacia wood and overlay it with gold too, on which to set the bread of display, what's known as the bread of display or commonly the show bread, the bread to be shown or the bread of it's also called the bread of the presence now if you recall what we had mentioned a little bit earlier we had mentioned a little bit earlier that there's a certain principle here um for the persons and the events and the tabernacle we have the assurance or the the imminent the um the the subjective faith that in the tabernacle everything is typical everything is a type and the details must of necessity be received be kabbalah kabbalah received as such now there are two warnings let's go over these two warnings again nothing may be dogmatically asserted to be a type without explicit new testament authority that means a dogma basically a dogma is an edict of the romans in other words, like they just tell you this is what you do, or otherwise we're going to crucify you. You know what I mean? That's how they basically do that. That's dogma. dogma. You understand? Child really doesn't deal with dogma. Man deals with dogma. So nothing should be dogmatically asserted to be a type unless it has an explicit New Testament authority. And secondarily, all types not so authenticated. You know, saying we trust, but let's verify. If we, if we trust it, and then while we're verifying, we don't get a verification. It's not so authenticated. It must be recognized as having the authority of analogy. In other words, the authority of comparison. Somebody's making a, a comparison, but but it is not. It's not to be asserted. You understand? Without without having an explicit explicit New Testament. Authority. That means um, a, a a documentation, a reference point, not just something somebody's making up. So the analogy we, we regard it as analogy or some spiritual congruity merely. That means that spiritually speaking, well, yes, the two might be somewhat related in the point that's being made. Now, when we look at the showbread right here, we see that the bread, as it was intended in this time in Exodus, was eaten by Aaron. Aharon and his sons. Every Shabbat, every Sabbath day, this bread was replaced. Right now, what do we learn by this? We learn to trust and to rest, being dependent on Yahweh's provision or the provision of the true God in the name of Yeshua, because Yeshua is a better covenant. He's a better covenant. Hebrew eight verses 6 to 7, Hebrew 10 and 16. The Torah, this, see now this is symbolic of Torah being inscribed in the heart. And how many loaves do we have here? We have 12 loaves. So or, or, or 6 here, 6 here, 12 loaves of bread. 
Now, this is what's called the Shulchan, Lechem Panim, or the table of sh- shoe bread, the, sh- the table of shoe bread fed by Devar Ma'at. Uh, now we have um, some other references right here. Um, on my tables, my tables, I think this is a, was 11 verses 28 to, to 30, John chapter 6 verses 32 to 58 where he's speaking about I am, you know, he is he is that bread that gives life. Now as your father, it's not talking about the manna, but we're speaking about the bread inside the Mishkan, the bread inside the tabernacle or the, or the bread that's on the Shulchan Le Lechem Panim. The table of shoe, of shoe bread. So, Exodus twenty-five, twenty-three to thirty documents that. Now the next, the next element that comes into view, and we want to see if we find this other um, um, picture here that we was touching on before. Some of these other pictures we can close up. So we have the shoe bread right here. We touched on the ark right here and then we want to speak on the menorah so we have the menorah we have that pic actually right down here so let's bring the menorah which is um some call it the candlestick but really the oil it was the oil lamp so right here let's put the menorah the the golden the golden candlestick or the golden lamp it's not candlestick but lampstand lampstand miscalled, falsely called candlestick. Candles came later on. So if you say like a candle, lighting a candle, that's by analogy. That's by some spiritual congruity. But what was explicitly stated was that oil lamps, these are oils, so what burns, the fuel that burns it is not some fire on some animal fat or wax, but it's actually oil that is burning in the menorah or in the, uh, falsely here they have candlestick right down here. A lot of folks may not pay attention, even ourselves sometimes still revert to saying candlestick, an error. But actually it's not a candlestick, it's a lampstand. It's a lampstand, big difference. Ha Elohim instructed them to make a six-branch, seven-lamped lampstand known as the menorah. What it says, six branches. This is why right here when you see the Magan David right here, or a Magan David-like symbol right here. Really, it's the Magan David on, on its side right here. It's really the possible arrangement of the lampstand. When we look at the instructions, we find Yahweh stating to Moses to make a six-branch, seven-lamp lampstand. You see, and understanding that it is in this shape and does make this shape is paying attention to what is written. When we pay attention, with it's six branches, seven lamps. How, how does that work out? What's the math on that? It's the menorah, and it's to be made of pure gold, of solid gold, in other words, pure gold. No other um, element, no alloy, no cutting corners, so-called saving money or any of that kind of that kind of worldly secular crap. Exodus 25 verses 31 to 40. Ha Elohim instructed them to make the tabernacle of ten strips of fine twisted linen of blue, purple, crimson, yarn, and a design of cherubim or cherubim worked into them. As we've touched on when we showed you the tabernacle and the co- the four the four coverings already, Exodus 26 verses 1 to 6. Ha Elohim instructed them to make eleven cloths of goat's hair for a tent over the tabernacle. Eleven cloths of what kind of hair? Goat's hair. Exodus 26 7 to 13 and coverings of tanned rams skins and what's known as um uh, uh tahash tahash um or tahashim um skins exodus 26 verses verse 14 
Ha Elohim also instructed them to make planks or boards of acacia wood for the tabernacle. Exodus chapter 26, verses 15 to 25. Ha Elohim instructed them, and we should really say instructed us, actually, taking responsibility, we should start to actually say that he instructed us to make this. He instructed our forefathers in their time, and now we, in covenant, if we are in covenant, of covenant, we are also instructed, you understand, to to make these things. So first thing we have to understand and better understand the instructions, the instructions right here, so we can get the right structure. Ha Elohim instructed them and us to make a curtain of blue, purple, and crimson yarn, and fine twisted linen with a design of Kiru, Kirubim, Cherubim, Keperim, to serve as a partition, to serve. So, they, so the Keperim or the Cherubim, they serve as a partition, obscuring the Holy of Holies, Exodus 26, 31 to 33. So what we're looking at right here, looking at the, the um, Ark of the Ark and the Mercy Seat, this is actually covered with that particular, I think we have uh, another picture of that. That's what we said. There's a lot of moving parts here. We have another picture of of um, that particular 